Hello, everyone, and welcome to block party number 94. We've been going at it for over six hours now. This is the first time we're recording, and we're deep into the topic of solar radiation management. Based on some awesome comments by James a little bit ago, I want to go ahead and share uh, a little sketch that uh, that, that inspired, um, which is... So, you know, we've been talking about marine cloud brightening. We've been talking about MIR. We just mentioned ICE 911. And there are others all within SRM. And what I'm proposing is we all get together, inspired by James, and create a united front for SRM, right? Now, that united front is, of course, going to come up with some resistance, just like there's, you know, been some competition among these different solutions, and we need to get past that with tremendous urgency and form this united front. There's also been some competition between SRM and decarbonization, which that last poster that I shared, which I'll just share again very briefly. Um, this one, this is designed to bridge that gap and say, listen, decarbonization we acknowledge decarbonization. You are the big solution. You're great. That's wonderful. There's just a missing ingredient, right? Kind of like, hey, your, your toothpaste tastes great. We love it. It's just that it lacks fluoride. Fluoride is the missing ingredient to toothpaste. SRM is the missing ingredient to decarbonization for cooling the planet. Now back to the sketch I was doing. So we need to bridge that gap with things like that poster so that we can bring decarbonization together with SRM to present to the world a whole solution, right? That everyone can agree to, which is SRM plus decarbonization. And you'll see here, decarbonization is this big, it's the giant elephant in the room for the people who get past, who are able to get past those barriers of denial like I was talking about earlier, and I'm referring to as Jonathan's barriers that basically, what, is it, is it even happening? Is it part of some cyclical thing? Are we about to enter some ice age? So really we shouldn't be trying to cool the planet because that's gonna cause problems, right? Um, so again, we need, it's the, the whole thing beckons for unity. And so we need to create some pathway uh, to be able to, to create this unity. And then of course, um, there's another big merger uh, here that's beckoning, which is this whole thing, this whole solution, this whole solution around cooling the planet, right, also needs to merge with the food solution, which I'm saying that's the Trojan horse that can get everyone into the room so that we can then merge that with the cooling the planet uh, solution. Because the cool thing about food, in addition to having the human side of taking care of people and the animal side of eliminating animal cruelty, torture and enslavement and rape of animals, um, is we also have the saving of the biosphere related to food, right? The whole decimation of the Amazon and other fragile ecosystems in order to make way for animal agriculture. So we combine those two, food and cool, right? Transforming food and cooling the planet to creating a whole solution for saving, healing, and ultimately transforming life on earth as a whole. So I wanted to just share that whole that whole sketch and so as you can see the general trend here is many things converging onto one a united front around srm almost no one knows about srm because everyone's into decarbonization so we find a way to bridge that a whole solution around cooling the planet merge the cooling with the food and we have literally we if we nail the both of those we've solved 90 plus percent of the problem of the decimation of life on earth. In a nutshell, what's decimating life on earth is heat and destroying ecosystems to make way for animal agriculture. Those two combined, those are the biggies, right? Um, and in fact, animal agriculture has been the biggest contributor to greenhouse gases 
as Dr. Silas Rao has, has uh, presented br a brilliant analysis of. So with that, I'm, I'll pass the talking feather, but first let me mention, welcome John, great to see you John. Anytime anyone wants to pause recording for any reason whatsoever, just do this or say, hey, Jamin, please pause. I'll be happy to pause recording. It's never a problem. And then we can always pick up right again. After can you pause it for one second? Yes, pa pausing recording. All right, resuming after a brief pause. Um, so we, um, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're planning some major events in Los Angeles and we want to get a weekly cycle as kind of our next milestone of weekly food healers, love all, feed all events uh, at a single location in Los Angeles that happens every Saturday with food, with drink, with music, with dancing, with comedy, with speeches that just creates a whole experience. And we want to bring in both food and SRM uh, into one united conversation. And I've talked before about, you know, focusing on the asteroid in the film, Don't Look Up, right? Which of course, that asteroid is a metaphor for climate change and destruction of life on earth generally. Um, brilliant movie, must see if you haven't seen it. <laughs> and since um, more and more people like us are watching that movie and saying, oh my God, because the central takeaway is, wait a second, people are asleep, people are deluded, people are putting the focus on money, 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 and uh, you know, forgetting about and ignoring these, fun this, these fundamental crises, which um, if we don't get a handle on them in literally a matter of months, it could be too late because of collapse, right? Right now, many argue that we're in a process of collapse, right? And the two most powerful things we can do to prevent collapse of civilization are cool the planet and feed everyone. Feed everyone the right kind of foods, healthy plant-based based foods to make sure that nobody slips through the cracks and, uh, you know, so that we can prevent the world from devolving into violence and also tremendous food scarcity uh, driven by planetary overheating. So we've got to get A pluses on both of those classes, right, of solutions, cooling the planet and feeding everyone the right foods, plant-based foods. And with that, I pass the talking feather and encourage everyone to jump in. Don't hesitate. Life on earth is at stake and we need to hear from you. Passing the feather. Yeah. Um, thanks, Jamin. Um, yeah. Just getting back to what you were sharing there on the drum board there a while ago and about, you know, the main point that we're trying to get out here is like, uh, you know, to create unity on SRM. You know, because there is like, what for lack of a better word, fucking dissension among the ranks in, in, in regards to one thinking, you know, one is better than the other or one, it's either this one or that one. And it should neither be that or the other. It's both. It's all. And that's what we need to agree on. That's what we need to have unity on. It's all. And in wherever their best situated situation is best for them is where they, they need to be. But in regards to timeline and everything else, I think all is all, everyone else is also in agreement that the critical situation that we're facing at the moment is the, the loss of the Arctic ice. So therefore, that is the first thing we need to turn our attention to. And we can't, if, we, if, if the group of people that I had mentioned can't come together in a conversation and come to some form of unity uh, around SRM and agree like that, you know, to work together regardless, but to tackle the main priority first and maybe give us time as Professor Wadham's a sticky plaster on it, buy us time to work t together on the other forms of solar radiation management. That is critical. And the reason I say it's critical, um, and I stress that it's an urgent now that we, of all times, and why I think Guy McPherson is, or should be there, I'm slightly kind of a little bit put out by the fact, and I'm glad you're recording this, I'm slightly put out by the fact that he's of late, even though he's been the first one out there with the clarion call, and he, and uh, and I know that his his message clearly knows that there's really nothing we can be done about can be done about it at this stage. 
unless mere reflection is run run off very quickly. And in one of his recent videos, he even said, even if that, even if that's um, even if it's even if it's, it could be too late for that, he's saying. So if he's admitting, if he's admitting that he's um, too late for it could be too late for a mirror project because of the time and the, the the amount of work that would go into producing the amount of mirrors needed and everything else and the impl implementation of that if he's almost on the verge of admitting that we could be out of time for that then surely he should be at least acknowledging that we should you know also review every other aspect of solar radiation management and take it all into concept because there should be no rock left unturned and that's what I'm saying. And the reason for this now, I want you to, uh, I would like to be able to screen share just a couple of minutes of a news item that I think all of the scientists involved in solar radiation management or any other form of that, regardless whether it's mirror reflection or any other, they need to be aware of this. And this is a movement now that's starting. And it's starting because of, basically because of Jim and the amount of att attraction and attention that we drew you and you mainly yourself drew in cop because we were the number one draw of attention about marine cloud brightening and mirror reflection and plant-based foods and we were the only ones able to supply the thousands of people passing us with the correct information which they could all go away and look with the links that we provide them to actually back up what we were saying just like the guy does he, he repeats uh, peer-reviewed literature this is not coming out of the man's head he's pe repeating peer-reviewed literature and from his uh, background in habitat he can see where all, the big picture is leading to we do not survive without our habitat and our habitat is, is failing us and we need to come to consensus about that so i'll just share this now on the this news item for two sec two minutes and i'll finish what i'm saying then Yes, please, please go for it, James. Thanks. Dry the Amazon. So 60 experts and scientists have written a letter. This is what they say. We call for an immediate political action from governments, the United Nations and other actors to prevent the normalization of solar geoengineering as a climate policy option. Come to think of it, how is dimming the sun even a solution? The only way to tackle global warming is by addressing the root cause of the problem, not covering the problem with another layer of reflective particles. Dimming the, sun rays, the sun's rays is a quick fix. And we should be done with tampering the earth. We've cut forests, put enormous pressure on the planet by expanding agricultural land, by increasing livestock farming, by filling lakes, building houses and factories on them. We've cut mangroves, built artificial islands, polluted rivers, polluted the land, the air. We've burnt fossil fuels, coal, oil, gas. And now all of this is coming back to bite us and we want to change the composition of the atmosphere. You see, the earth is not a guinea pig. It's not a lab rat that we can keep experimenting on. And honestly, there is no need to dim the sun's light. Just think about what happened a few months back. You know, during the lockdown, we realized that our planet has the magical ability to heal itself. One month of lockdown and the air was cleaner. Water was flowing once again in clogged rivers. The birds were back, the animals were back. There were less pollutants. If one lockdown could transform our surroundings, imagine what a lifetime of conscious choices can do. I know we have big goals and very less time. And we cannot let our planet's temperature increase any further. And this is exactly where we can turn to science for real solutions. We must use science to make the transition to greener fuel smoother and to decrease pressure on agricultural land. We must use science to find alternatives to livestock farming. Tampering with the atmosphere all over, over again is not an option. Dimming the sun's rays sounds like a Frankenstein solution. It should be off the table, as scientists say it should be. Weon is now available in your... So there you go, like there's already a, uh, an, uh, an organized campaign by the mainstream media, Weon being one of the puppet masters of the mainstream media moguls, and they're working for the fossil fuel companies now already because they see that um, solar radiation management is gaining momentum. And they don't want that because it's going against their fucking keep business as usual. 
their their plan is to save them it saved their own asses all right because they know that it we're heading fucking for the cliff but their lack of complete understanding or ignorance to the whole situation is as long as they have enough money they can survive so the point is there's already a, a, an organized campaign starting f- by the top fucking percent one percent basically that's why we're up against all the time and they're already starting a, 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 an anti fucking a geoengineering program now yes they used they showed the idea of uh, atmospheric injection and that but if you showed if i show you the whole thing they basically are denouncing it and they i'd like to know who the 60 scientists are who signed the petition because for the 700 and odd scientists that they got to sign the last time for against the idea that there was global warming half of them were vets and you know dentists and things like that like so the point is they already have a um they have a campaign up and going running against it already and they're putting it in the minds of people now already that we can't interfere we're reflecting the sun she literally said it in one sentence yes yes the plan is heating up and we can't afford it to heat up anymore but we can't play with uh, well, dimming the sun, which was the complete uh, oxymoron yeah, statement. Like, does a campaign against it, and if we can't form unity oh, among the, gro- the group of people who are already advocating for it for a long time, then we have no way of getting or achieving anything unless we come together and form unity and back each other up 100%. Okay. And we all know the priorities to save the Arctic, so therefore I'm. that's why I'm baffled that guy and... Uh, yeah, aren't willing to co- uh, uh, concede that much and say let's get behind the marine cloud brighton first and we'll all work together to get the mirror out as well at the same time you know what i mean this this wow. this, this is called co- cooperation at a time of desperation and we need that now passing the further thank you james i'd just like to tack on a quick comment and then pass the feather to whoever would like to talk next is that there, you know, with, with the images and everything, they were talking about geoengineering, but what they were really referring to was stratospheric aerosol injection, which I'm opposed to also. But what they're doing is they're taking the dirty bathwater of stratospheric aerosol injection and throwing out the baby with the bathwater where the baby that needs to be saved are responsible non-invasive forms of solar radiation management. Yes, they're geoengineering, but they are the good side of geoengineering. And yes, there is there are many dumb ideas and very destructive ideas within the broader class of solutions called geoengineering. And um, so by them taking aim at geoengineering, as opposed to just taking targeted aim at the cancer of stratospheric aerosol injection, they're doing humanity a massive disservice. And I really appreciate your sharing that. Passing the feather. Thank you. No, in the in their demonstration or their illustration, they showed the a- atmospheric okay. injection. But if you look at the statement that the scientists are after, the petition the scientists are after filling out, the petition says all types of geoengineering need to be banned and laws need to be implemented to stop even the um, uh, stop even the uh, sorry no uh, the study of it and, and and proposal of it. Like they just want to stamp it out completely. So all types, they're talking about all types. They just showed an example of stra- atmospheric injection because that's what the general population understand as geoengineering anyway. They only know about atmospheric injection. They're already opposed to it. And they're using that Trojan horse, the fact that the most of the world only knows about stratospheric injection and are opposed to it. They're using that as the bad horse, as you said, to throw out the rest in the backwater. But they are after stating in the in the petition all types of geoengineering needs to be banned. Yeah, that looked uh, definitely like this is Bill speaking. That looked pretty organized and uh, pretty worrisome. Um, one of the things that Dr. Yi was uh, good at doing at the recent COP multiple times and then whoever was the main announcer repeated constantly was Dr. Yi pointed out that burning oil and coal is the essence of geoengineering. So right here is geoengineering at its worst. And that's the burning of fossil fuels. So if you want to throw out geoengineering, you would simply stop burning fossil fuels because we all know that that's heating up the planet. 
exactly. I've got uh, one thing else. Um, I'm again, I'm Bill. This is my first time on this um, forum, uh, which I discovered uh, from a friend, and I'm working on SRM. Um, uh, uh, solar radiation management um, uh, uh, on the ground level as a building contractor trying to find uh, and doing some testing. Um, and uh, one of the things that I've discovered um, in my background was when I attended and became a certified Build It Green contractor. Can you see that okay? Okay. The one closest to me is based out of Oakland, California, and I have, uh, I'm going to reach out back to them before I, I, I was going to do it this morning, but anyways, um, then I got involved in this chat, and um, so what they're, they're basically based around um, smart building. Now, I mean smart, I mean they'll take a house that they properly engineer in the middle of some of the coldest areas in America, and they'll put a thermal, um, a thermal core in the center of the house. They'll face the house a particular way, let's just say it's Southwest, to absorb any sunlight coming through these, at, at cert, coming through the glass that has a very low E factor to allow as much of the sun's rays to come through and to absorb into that thermal mass, in this case being concrete, you could use a rock or whatever. And the house can be surrounded by snow and freezing outside, and the house does not even need a heater because of the, the incredibly smart engineering that's gone into that house. So I'm gonna reach out to them. Um, I know that we need help uh, in figuring out some of the solutions. They've already done it, um, they've done it on they, they've done it to save money and for 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 actually probably all the same reasons that all of the the SRM and all the, the things that we're trying to do, primarily more for homes than the planet. We're just explain, ex, expanding it into the planet. But I'm going to reach out to them and uh, uh, I think that they can also help us out with our efforts, humanitarian efforts in especially Ground Zero, which is besides the entire world, as far as wet bulb um, temperatures go, which is India and all of the buildings there are basically made out of concrete. So we're looking at putting, painting the outsides of them with the brightest white with, I think it's barium in it or something. I don't know, it has to be a green product and um, ish and, uh, and putting mirrors on the roofs. And we think that can passively cool those structures down enough to make them habitable, which is something that they're basically not at this point. I'll pass the feather as Jamin says. Yeah, that's a great idea, Bill, is find, finding these natural allies that are already um, leveraging um, the sun's radiation in positive ways. Uh, passive heating, passive cooling, these are really great uh, examples and ways of getting people into the conversation because they can experience them directly, right? Marine cloud brightening. <laughs> um, is not something a lot of people have, you know, immediate access to in terms of oh got it got it right um and so um you know the 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 education of the masses is absolutely key here and that's why you know i've emphasized the kind of the, the merging of uh solar radiation management with food healers love all feed all uh etc um as you know a grand solution to the problem of the asteroid in Don't Look Up, passing the feather.
And I talked earlier about the law of the singularity, that there is a singular solution, which uh, is the best, this, a singular solution in terms of a strategy and a mechanism for inviting and welcoming the rest of humanity into this conversation, which let's face it, a tiny, tiny percentage of us are even engaged in, right? For two simple reasons. One is we are addicted to the game of hoarding and, you know, getting ahead, right? I mean, we're so busy looking to the left and looking to the right in terms of how are we doing relative to the the other humans in the human rat race, we're so focused on who's on our left and who's on our right that we're not, we're losing fact, we're losing sight of the fact that we're racing towards the edge of the cliff, right? Rebel without a cause, James Dean style, right? And that's a tragedy compounding a tragedy, right? That we're so focused on the race to get ahead uh, which is, you know, either about survival, uh, if one is poor, or about uh, self-aggrandizement, if one is wealthy. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I am so in favor of and working hard toward, yeah, Sarah refers to it as the all-day monopoly game, not a term I came up with. I heard it first from Daniel Schmachtenberger, but we're so locked into the all-day monopoly game um, that we don't see that we could be having a much better go of life. We could actually survive if we worked together rather than in competition with each other. And in order to drive that point home, <clears throat> we have food healers and love all, feed all and all the beautiful things that we want to bring, that we're gonna be bringing together in Los Angeles on a regular basis. Remember, repetition, repetition, repetition. And, and just letting people learn through their own taste buds and their own observations that, wow, this is a really beautiful thing. People coming together to feed everyone plant-based foods, creating the world's first compassionate metropolis. That's the Trojan horse within whose belly we can pack SRM. And because the, the, the sequence that I see is food brings people together, together people engage in conversation and engaging in conversation with people you like and trust can then help people to learn about SRM. That in a nutshell is the strategy which I propose as the singular solution uh, in answer to the law of the singularity. What do we do? What is the singular path we take? What is the path forward, right? We've got to get people on board en masse. And so the food healers thing is, is, it's really two things in one, or it's many things in one, but two of the biggest things are number one, showing people the beauty of feeding other people. And then as we build and build and build, because our goal is very clear on that, make sure everyone has free access to nutritious, delicious plant-based foods that they don't have to pay for. It's free. It's a basic human right. And getting the world to make that transition to basic human needs become basic human rights actually eliminates the need to win relative to your perceived competitors at the all day monopoly game. You can actually walk away from the game and be just fine in this new world. And once we get people away from that hyper myopic focus on the all day monopoly game and competition with other people, then they can look up and say, ah, oh, now that I no longer have to focus on this board game, this boring board game, you know, what else is there? Well, saving, healing, and transforming life on earth. And now that you've taken the on-ramp of food and gotten into the game that way, now it's like, okay, what else is there to do? Well, cool the planet, right? Stop the decimation of the biosphere and uh, engage in restoration, healing. Passing the feather. Thank you. So 
So, Jamin, what would you think if um, we were to draw out the kit? What would you call it? A cool kit? You know, like Kit Kat? Would you yeah, call it yeah, yeah. Kit? I mean, yeah. what would you call it? Yeah. So Sarah was talking about, you know, what kind of a kit could we either give away or or whatever? Um, and so it, we've seen earlier today, thanks to Bill and uh, and Jonathan uh, primarily, um, some really cool kind of home solutions for solar radiation management uh, that people can can implement. Um, I've got oh, an wait, idea. I have a better idea. What if we give them, um, you know how like uh, we're getting those free, supposed free COVID tests mailed to us? What if we get them to scan the QR code and then somehow we figure out how to capture their information? But I'm just saying like, we should just send them the kit directly to their house. I don't know if that's a good idea because of shipping, but I just feel like it, because everybody's always coming up to us at our events. Like we always have amazing, uh, conversations and, and we talk about this kind of stuff to them and they want to know like bill said that you have a very uh very high level of intelligence it seems like in santa monica you have an older crowd and you have you know tourists that are smart i mean it's just i don't know it just seems like a you have a lot of movie stars that live there too in santa monica a lot of very 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 big movie stars live in santa monica so i'm just thinking like we got to give them something to do to take action and people love that people love to come to an event and they love you know free is the number one word in america free 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 nobody wants to pay for anything so you, you give them the free food and they're like you want to help do this in your neighborhood here here's the kit tell you everything how to do just like where we give them the the, the recipe to the stew we don't try to try to hide the recipe we're like here it's online here it's on our website here, you, we have a copy of it if you don't have a piece of paper. Um, I mean, if you know, most people take a picture of it or we somehow, but I feel like it's got to be something like that. It makes so them I've got a feel suggestion. like they're doing it. Can you hear me okay, Sarah? Yeah. Right. Uh, my suggestion would be something as simple, but I still need to do, I need to actually do this test, which would be, it would be a like a one foot by one foot silica-based mirror and a small thermo two small thermometers and um you basically th these are very inexpensive i, I mean like I'm, I'm talking about a very uh, still pure it has to be a, a real glass mirror but it could be uh, very thin an eighth of an inch or something with two small thermometers and then you show them maybe I, i'm just thinking i'm just thinking out loud here and then you and then you prop it up at a 18 degrees angle, which I think I forgot exactly. It's like, it's like, I think it's like three and a half inches over a one foot. Cause I know it's six and a 0.25 over two feet angle. And then you just haven't put a thermometer, uh, just, just, just like the least expensive little thermometer underneath the center of that mirror. And then you just have them put uh, a thermometer, let's say a foot away from that mirror or two feet away from that mirror and watch what happens. Easy peasy. That should that should do it. They you know should what? just see. Yeah, but, but, so I, I, there's a, actually there's a much simpler way I think that we can get the point across, and that would be, for example, let's say we had two tents. We've already talked about having two tents: one for the stew and the other for uh, the smoothies, the agua fresca, the beverages. Right? What if one of those tents had a reflective top? And the other one else had a an opaque top, right? And uh, you just feel the difference. Maybe we let the uh, smoothie one have the reflective top because I'd say it's more important to keep the beverages cool than the stew cool. Um, but you know, uh, or even just have a, just a tent period with, or two tents next to each other with, with that are just for that experience of getting out of the sun and getting out of the heat. Anyway, just wanted to, to put that out there. Thank you. Oh, and also, we, we, we did look at some stuff. I think, was it Jonathan who brought it to our attention before? Or, um, or who was it? But there was like this infrared camera where you could, you know, 
that could look at you and and so we could have someone with a reflective suit and the infrared camera could look at that versus someone with an opaque suit anyway there, there's but but yeah the, the visceral education of that rather than a take-home sort of science experiment or whatever but just have it right there so they can just experience it bam here walk here walk there right i remember at the lawrence hall of science in berkeley california you know go, i was way back when i was like 19 20 years old i was a day camp counselor and so i took the kids and we went up to this big ceramic whale that had, you know, white ceramic and black ceramic tiles right next to each other. I said, here, put your hand on the white, put your hand on the dark, feel the difference. Voila. Passing the feather. I think that's a great idea. I and mean, we could wear those virtual reality gl glasses because we already do that anyway at a lot of our events something like that maybe they could put on they can come into the one tent and put on their reality glasses and see what's really going on or something like that i don't know i, I just think like something that's people love to engage and it's a great place to teach people and educate them Yeah, my example, Jamin, <clears throat> was basically uh, just coming up with a kit and uh, that some people could take away that obviously takes money. So that's not maybe the, uh, yours is, uh, and, and um, especially with what uh, Mr. Cole was talking about earlier with the, with the Mylar, I think he was saying, cover, it, it should be dramatic. Um, a dramatic difference. So you get one tent that's black and you get another tent that's got that reflective on it. That's about as, that's about as uh, visceral as you can get. I don't know if visceral is the right word. Is that the only visual? <clears throat> yeah, you know, what, what, one thing that's coming to mind is we could do kind of like two sort of walk through experiences. I'm gonna do a little sketch of what I'm talking about. Um, this is just a, a concept I'm sure we'd have to design it and uh, really we should have Jonathan here for that because he's really good at this sort of thing but imagine we had sort of kind of like a uh, uh, anyway just just like a like a tunnel that you walk through right that just has kind of this this dome like thing um, you know this U shape this upside down U shape and one of them has um, is made of just reflective material, and the other one is made of opaque material. But in either case, when you when you walk inside the tent, right, your experience uh, is there's no sunlight coming in, right? That's all reflected away in this case, and here it's absorbed. And the idea here is that that which is absorbed, of course, it's going to re-radiate uh, back inside the tents, and it's just going to be re it's going to be like an oven in there, right? It, it'll it's equally dark in both cases, but one is hot and the other is cold, and that way we get kind of this walk through thing, and we do the whole safe social distancing, um, and uh, so you know you walk through, and then we wait, you know half a minute before the next person can walk through so that we let the the COVID clear out, so to speak. Uh, but anyways, something like that, that's just like experiential. And we, we could call this one like the tunnel of love or something cool like that, right? And uh, versus, we'll just call this one the other tunnel, <laughs> right? You know, something funny like that. Anyway, passing the feather. Yeah, I'm all for it. I could just totally say all for hot, it. House and, hot house and cool house. Sure. There you go. Sure, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. And even have like a question, which do you think would be hotter, right? It's almost like a riddle. And then, of course, whenever you pose a question to somebody, they want the answer. Well, what better way to get the answer than to just walk through it and feel it, right? Um, and 
you know, more broadly in terms of the whole layout of this place that we're going to create, uh, Melissa and I, Melissa, my partner, who's an artist, she'll be joining us in 28 minutes. In 28 minutes, we'll, we'll have our, um, uh, the Heart of Transformation series with uh, Dharmendra, uh, who, who will join us and he, he'll lead for two hours starting in at, at uh, 2.30 p.m. Pacific time. Um, but we, so Melissa and I over the, over the last couple of days have been brainstorming about what, you know, sort of like a, a framing or a context for this whole place that we're going to create as a, you know, temporary place. We build it out, say on Saturday morning and it's got, you know, the food and beverage tents, the tunnel of love, the cool tunnel, the hot tunnel, et cetera, and other stuff like the floating animals, the, you know, and uh, dirigible animals that, that Silish and company created for COP26. Uh, we can repurpose those for, and have, bring them in LA, you know, like the cow in the room.org, et cetera, um, have those floating. For a context for this whole space that we're gonna create, with music, with dancing, with Darth Vader, with, you know, et cetera, et cetera, people giving speeches and everything. Um, one powerful metaphor for this whole thing <laughs> could be, and we could even have a big banner that says it, welcome back to the garden. Welcome back to the garden. Now, when you hear welcome back to the garden, I just wanna hear a couple of people mention, just say, hey, what, what comes to mind if I say welcome back to the garden? Garden of Eden. That's it. And we could call it the Garden of Eden or of eating, right? But just welcome back to the garden. It, it, you know, it, 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 in and of itself, it's a riddle that beckons to be answered. Which garden, right? We were banished from the garden because we started killing and eating each other <laughs> and coveting and, and all, all these horrible things that human, you know, humanity has done, um, regardless of whose fault it was but welcome back to the garden and whoa. I mean, let people have this experience of uh, paradise, right? I remember when I went to uh, Salt Lake City back in the early nineties, I was just on a trip across the country by train, stopped in Salt Lake City. And so I went to go see the whole, you know, beautiful Mormon garden that I'd heard about. And you walk in there and it's just like, it's like paradise, everything is so beautiful. And there are these, lovely young gals coming up to you, offering to give you a tour and welcome you. I was like, shoot, I I've arrived. I'm in paradise, whatever. Did I die and go to heaven? You know, sign me up was the, you know, the feeling that one gets. And of course, I'm sure a lot of people sign up when they go to that, you know, Garden of Eden-like experience in Salt Lake City, Utah. So yeah, welcome back to the garden. So in other words, but let's, let, 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 let's think holistically. How do we put this all together as a whole experience? So someone's, you know, roller skating by and they're like, whoa, you know, Darth Vader is singing Spanish love songs and there's free food and free beverages and everyone's happy and people are engaged in conversation. I kind of see it. Another element that comes to mind is the forum in ancient uh, Athens where people would come together and talk. How on earth did the Greeks become so advanced? Conversation, collective intelligence, and the forum is, I would argue, the ultimate expression of collective intelligence because people are free to roam around, everything's free, conversation, jump into whatever conversation you want. And if some really stimulating debate or conversation is happening, people gather around. Oh my goodness, what are all, what's everyone gathering around there for? I don't know. Well, let me walk, walk the 50 feet over to that part of the forum and find out. Right. So, um, <clears throat> and, you know, with stuff floating in the air and this and that, it's just like, how do we, how do we create kind of like this paradise on earth feeling so that people say, whoa, this is a whole different experience of life. Life indeed can be different. And these people are committing to a whole, you know, transformed, uh, way of life, modality of life on earth, where basic human needs become basic human rights. Here, I'll screen share this acronym, which maps well to this, which Silish came up with, which is this, T-H-I-S, transforming, healing, and intentionally saving 
life on earth. And so we could have some, you know, quick little meme like this is it. This is it, you know, something like that. I don't know. Welcome back to the garden. This is it. Welcome home, you know, etc. Passing the feather. So again, referring to the law of the singularity, this is what we're, what we're co-creating for Los Angeles is that singular solution that we are all yearning for uh, without knowing it um, that will just create a dynamo of people coming in, people sharing, you, hey, Holmes, you got to get your butt out here. There's the coolest stuff going on here in Santa Monica. And again, repetition, repetition, Santa Monica Saturdays, every Saturday whether it's Santa Monica or, or, or Pan Pacific Park, whichever, right? Let's, and we may need to experiment to find the best location, but let's find that best location and really develop it and develop this into a thing. All right. I've been here for seven hours straight with no break. Um, I'm going to take a pause to recording.